morning, may you open our hearts and our minds to hear afresh from you. May you encourage us in whatever situations we're facing. May you lead us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And may we grow in our love for you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The English way of defining words often causes an obscure and circular definition, which literally means a complicated system to explain something which can cause confusion. And many times we draw the wrong conclusions from words that are said, words that are, words that are read, and then we try to apply that principle to other words, which in fact are not explained or defined in that matter at all. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. The opposite of good is bad. The opposite of on is off. The opposite of cold is hot. What we tend to do is we take that principle and we use it for other words, especially biblical words. We say the opposite of holy is unholy. Might not be true. Because the definition of holy is good, sacred, or godlike. So therefore, the opposite would be bad, not sacred, and ungodlike. To truly understand our biblical words, sometimes we have to go back to the original text. We have to go back to the Greek. We have to go back to the Hebrew and see what it actually means. Now, the word holy, I'm going to do something that, again, I've always been told never to do. I'm going to mention Hebrew and Greek in one sermon in one sentence. The word holy comes from the Hebrew word kodesh and the Greek word hagios. Those two words literally translate as to be set apart or to be separated from the common or ordinary. And the opposite of that would be not set apart from the common or the ordinary. Holy and unholy. Are we separated from the common and ordinary or are we not? The passage that Helen read to us is titled, Be Holy. Be holy. It carries on by quoting Isaiah. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that it may so uh, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, we are holy. We are set apart for Jesus. The church is holy and set apart from the world for Jesus. One of the joys I have as an ADDO is walking alongside people, exploring their vocation. But people come to me, particularly when it's at the point of exploring ordained ministry. I met with someone who was exploring yesterday. Towards the end of our time together, he looked at me and he went, gosh, you do ask me some difficult questions, Tim. I was like, do I? They're not deliberately tough, but they are questions that as a vocations team, we ask to make people really think about and articulate their faith. Because after all, that's what you need to do when you're preaching, when you're talking to people who are bereaved, when you're leading a service, when you're doing all sorts of things that ministers do. And of course, it's not just limited to ministers. It is a job of all of us. How do you articulate your faith? I asked a few questions. Some of the questions that I asked yesterday were things like this. Well, how do you see God working through the church? When have you felt let down by God and why? In what situations are you aware that you make a difference by being a Christian? How has reading the Bible made a difference to how you live? Now, on the face of it, they're not tough questions. But when you truly think about it and actually try and explain it, often a lot of the things are things that we take for granted. The individual who I was meeting said, 
There's nowhere else, Tim, that I really get asked these sort of questions. It's actually really good to pause and think through my answers so that I can articulate them better. They're just some of the examples of questions that we give. But as I listened to this gentleman yesterday, it was a real joy to hear him say how he saw the hope of the church for the future. He saw how he had picked up on the church being prayer-filled And he can see God at work through the church, through God's holy people who make up the church. I asked him a question, despite, forget traditions, what is the common things that you will see in church? And he gave me a few answers, the the right answers. And then he said, no building. No, actually no, not a building. Because the church isn't the building. The church is the people, the holy ones who are set apart for God. Too often... We come to church, we hear a sermon, we sing some songs, we chat over coffee, and off we go again. And that's all lovely. We go home and we have perhaps a roast dinner on a Sunday, perhaps something else. What if we actually came to church and thought about, where is God at work today? How is God impacting me in what I'm hearing, in what I'm singing in the moments of silence? What if we say, well, how can the sermon I hear make a difference to how I live? Or actually, I don't agree with that sermon. It's not what I would say. Do we actually take it on board or do we just listen because it's the done thing to do? Do we ask the question, what is different in my life because I am a Christian? What difference can you make in your spheres of influence because you profess Jesus as Lord, because you are holy and set apart for Jesus? They're deep questions. And I think too often we gloss over them and we don't really think about them. But we are holy. We are set apart because we know the Lord Jesus. We know our Heavenly Father. We know the Holy Spirit. In this passage, Peter is explaining to us the importance of being holy and set apart and what it actually means because all of us have been used for purposes that we were not made. All of us have been used for purposes in the world for which we are not made. Peter describes them as evil desires in verse 14. All of us sin. All of us fall short of the glory of God. All of us try our best to be holy, but it doesn't always work. Yet, that's the bad news. The good news is that God has brought us back. Because as Peter explains in verses 18 and 19, we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. Peter is thinking about how God brought back his people from Israel when they were in abusive slavery in Egypt through the Passover and how the sacrificial death of Jesus has ransomed us too. In these verses, we are reminded that we are called to live a life that is so radically different from the way that normal people behave. In many ways, there's a metaphorical line that Peter is drawing, saying, those who don't know Jesus are living in ignorance and succumb to evil desires of the world, but those of us who know Jesus are set apart, and that is really good news. Because we base our lives, or we try to base our lives, on what Jesus has taught us. We try to base our lives on what is written in this book. We don't try and go after the things of the world. Because we don't want to be ignorant. Or at least I hope we don't want to be ignorant to Jesus. In our walk with the Lord, we want to be not, we don't want to be ignorant because we want to know what he is saying to us. So we come back to the importance of Scripture once again. Discovering as we read the Word of God, we discover who God is. The great Selwyn Hughes once used to say to people, if they said, I don't believe in God, well, tell me, what, what God do you believe in? And he would, they would give their answer. And he would say, well, guess what? I don't believe in that God either. Because that God that you have described is not the God of the Bible. It is not God the Father. It is not God the Son. It is not God the Holy Spirit. We discover who the God of the Bible is and who God is today 
because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we come back to Jesus, we want to know more about him. Going back to the conversation I had yesterday, the individual was talking about how God has shaped his life over the last 10 years. And I think too often, we're so preoccupied with what we need to do, we miss what God is doing in us and through us. If I was to ask you, where, would you, where were you 10 years ago? Can you remember? Are you now in a very different place to where you expected to be 10 years ago? God is a God of surprises. And we need to know God and follow his callings. He will lead us to unexpected places. Because we are set apart for the calling that God has placed on our lives. Each of us have a calling, friends. Too often the church has used the word calling to only mean ordained ministry, and we've got it wrong. Every single person who professes Jesus as Lord has a calling from God. That means you. Each one of you sat here is called by God to do something. Now, I don't necessarily know what that is, but each one of you is called by God. And because we are set apart, we see things differently. We see that the world, what the world promises is not helpful or fulfilling, despite what our media say, despite the fact that the latest gadget, this latest perfume, this, be- this holiday in a wonderful sandy beach and clear blue sc- sea will bring you happiness, it will bring you joy, it will bring you fulfillment. Yes, it might be nice for the time that you're away, Or that gadget will be great until the next one comes out. Or that perfume will be great until the latest scent comes out that lasts for 24 hours instead of 20 hours or whatever it is. I don't use perfume, so I don't know. But the world tells us that that is how we live a fulfilled life. We get more and more and more stuff. But actually what we see when we know the God of the Bible is that as we study the Scriptures and grow in our relationship with Him, we start to discover more of the real reason why we were made. We start to discover what our calling is. And we start to see how living a life that is set apart from the world brings us fulfillment. The fulfillment that we can only get through knowing Jesus Christ, through knowing the Father and through knowing the Holy Spirit. All of this, friends, is based on Peter's awareness of what has happened in the last few decades when he was writing this. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the giving of the Spirit at Pentecost, the rise and spread of the early Christian movement, how it's not a totally new idea. It wasn't a totally new idea because Peter knew his scriptures. He knew the Old Testament. He knew that it was a fulfill, the fulfillment of a plan that, had been, that the prophets had glimpsed. When we read the Old Testament and we read the prophets, we see them pointing to Jesus and the plan that God has to redeem the world. The prophets, if you like, are the people who stood on the borders between heaven and earth, between our time and God's time. And we know from reading Scripture that being a prophet can be a very lonely and painful experience. Yet, they could discern what was going to happen. It's not looking into a crystal ball and gazing and going, oh, well, I think this is going to happen. It's not a fortune teller. The prophets were listening to God, and it was God who was telling them what he was going to do. There's a real difference there because God created us. God created the universe. He is the only one that is going to know what happens. In the culture of the ancient Middle East, the scriptures were well known. People were well versed in them. They knew what they said. There was a time when in this country, most people would know the scriptures. They'd at least know the Jesus stories, the parables, what Jesus said, what Jesus did. But I think that time has passed. We are in an era of biblical illiteracy. And I think, to me, that is what is contributing to the issues that society is facing as a whole. Why? Because we've lost the overarching story. We've lost the bigger picture. We focus on ourselves. Everything is about the individual. What's in it for me? But when we study the Scriptures and we see God's plan, 
we see that there is an overarching story to all of this. We see that there is a meta-narrative, something much bigger than we could ever know. We start to see more of how it all fits together. And as we explored last week, this can only be done with the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and through us. It's one of the reasons why I really like the Bible course that we did a couple of years ago. Because it doesn't drill down into the minute detail, but it gives us that big overarching picture of Genesis to Revelation and all that goes in between. It picks out certain books and says, this is what wisdom is. This is what poetry is. This is what the prophets are. And it gives us the tools to then go and study more and more. There is no course that could go through the entire Bible because it would take far, far, far too long. But we are equipped with the tools to study it ourselves and explore it ourselves. It shows how the scriptures link up. Our faith and hope are in God because of what Jesus did on the cross. A number of years ago when I was still in my ascending church, I was back in Ilkley. I was stood at the top of Brook Street, which was like the main street in the town. And it was always where the Christmas tree and the big white cross went at Easter time. We were stood there singing a song, I can't remember what it was, on Good Friday on our walk of witness. And I always remember a white car pulled up. They wound the window down. And they said, what are you doing? Why are you stood by a cross? We're like, it's Good Friday. What's Good Friday? It's a bank holiday today. They had absolutely no idea why, year upon year, that big white cross appeared at the top of Brook Street. Yet, as we know, that cross is crucial to uh, to our understanding of what God did and being set apart because of what Jesus achieved on that cross. It's one of the reasons I love this church and the fact we have a cross there. Because our eyes are drawn to the cross. It reminds us of what Jesus did. It reminds us of the victory that he achieved on that cross. It reminds us that when the curtain tore in two, he gave access to the Father. We are holy and set apart. Do we really know the Lord in that? Do we want to know him more? Peter then uses the wonderful image of a newborn baby craving the mother's milk and uses that image for us as Christians craving the spiritual milk. As I watched Joseph when he was young, he would want milk from Amanda and if he stopped feeding too early, he'd get really sad and cry. Are we like that with the Word of God? Are we like that with the Word of God? If we don't get enough, do we stop and cry? Maybe not literally. Joseph wanted enough milk to see him through to the next feed. He needs the milk to feed and to grow and to learn to live within a family. Friends, we need the same from God. We need the spiritual milk to grow, to be fed to learn to live within a family. As Chris said at the start, where else would such a group of us gather? Where else would you go and start singing, standing up when you're told to stand up, sit down when you're told to sit down, and sing songs together? Somebody once said to me, when I asked that question, in a pub or at a football match, we are a family learning to do life together. Becoming a Christian is in similar way, many ways, a similar journey to a newborn. We're born to new life. We're nourished and sustained through our discipleship, and we grow to maturity. We learn a new set of morals and ethics and what is right and wrong. We learn how to love in a Christian way, and that doesn't mean being nice to each other all of the time. Scripture says, rebuke and admonish. So if somebody says something to you that you don't like, it's not necessarily that they're not being Christian. We've all become too nicey-nice within the church. Sometimes we need to rebuke one another. Sometimes we need to have those hard conversations because the message has got watered down so much and we don't want to offend anyone. 
But sometimes that isn't the most helpful thing to do. Imagine somebody comes in and says, I have an addiction to dot, dot, dot. We don't just sit there and go, oh, well, that's lovely. Well done. That's good for you. We go, okay, how can we support you to break free? Because it's not good for you. That's just one example. I'm sure there's many more examples. There are things that we will do in our lives, bad habits that we have, that we know takes us away from God. But yet we keep them buried beneath the surface because we're worried of what people will say to us. But we want to grow in holiness because we are set apart. Now, I'm not saying we all go out at coffee and start telling each other off. But I am saying that there are times when we do need to have those tough conversations with our brothers and our sisters because we love them and we want them to grow in their relationship with the Lord. Peter quotes from Isaiah 40 and particularly explains that what matters is the word of the Lord, the living and abiding word of God and the word that is preached. Peter was, of course, writing at a time before the New Testament had been put together and that the word that was preached you most likely focuses on the prophets declaring that Jesus would come and he is the Messiah and, of course, the subsequent outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He's making the point that all of the above matters because it is fulfilling what the ancient prophets have said, that the word of God means the message about Jesus and what God has done through him. That, friends, is exactly the same word of God that we have today. It is exactly the same book, exactly the same that we have today. Yes, of course, now it's called the Bible, and we have the benefit of the New Testament and the benefit of hindsight. But it reminds us that the word of the Lord is of the utmost important importance. It's one of the ways that we can get our spiritual milk to grow as disciples. Followers of Jesus have discovered since the day of Pentecost that when they spoke to people about Jesus, something happened because people were interested. The word of Jesus carried an energy, a power beyond the mere words. I think we've lost that in the 21st century. I think we've lost the fact that Jesus, the word Jesus, the name Jesus, can bring about transformation, can bring about healing, can bring about so much more. People get gripped by it. They get transformed by it. They're given a new sense of the presence of God. And I want this to continue into 2024 and beyond. As the church, we should be introducing people to Jesus so that they can become Christians. They can be welcomed into our family and they can see the difference that it makes in their life. They can be transformed. They can be renewed. And then we go out into society and do exactly the same thing so that society can be transformed and renewed. Transform, revive, and heal society as we, used, we sang a couple of years ago. So I come back to one of my questions. How has reading the Bible made a difference to you? How has reading the Bible made a difference to your faith? The word of the Lord stands forever. It will not fail. It will not go away. And it will not change. Let's get to grips with Scripture once again. Rediscover what God is saying. See the meta-narrative. And speak hope, life, and truth into a world that seems content with anything goes. Amen.